How exactly do you think that Dawkins' description of genes is different from Noble's? Hmm. So that's a great, that's a really interesting question. You can answer it in two different ways. The first way is what scientifically was Dawkins trying to say, and what scientifically was Noble trying to say. So Dawkins, in a very famous book called The Selfish Gene, was basically arguing that if you want to understand aspects of evolution, you really shouldn't look at even at organisms, and definitely not at some kind of group selection, we should look at the selection at the level of gene, individual genes. And that this is the right perspective in which to understand uh, um, why certain type of evolutionary change happened over time. What Dennis Noble is saying in his book, The Music of Life, is saying, well, actually, says that, that kind of reductionist paradigm is not always the best way of looking at things. There may be a kind of top-down way of looking at things, an emergent way of looking at things, which could be equally valid. And so um, the scientific argument is really a question of an epistemological question, which is what is the best level at which to look at a system in order to understand its behavior and understand the right way of thinking about it. And so he's, Lenz Noble is famous for um, understanding the heart and writing down the first equations for the beating of the heart. And he says, well, look, if you look at a heart and you look at the, how the cells move in a heart, it's not, if you look at how, the, say, the concentration of calcium in a calcium channel goes up and down in a heart, that's not driven by the local microscopic details of the protein. That's driven by the overall beating of the heart, by a, a different, you can describe it by a differential equation and by boundary conditions, something macroscopic, which, which actually uh, has a downward causation on those particular cells. So one of them is saying you should look from down up. Another is saying you should look from the top down. And those of you the scientists will realize that actually this question of which is the right way of looking at it depends on the kind of question that you're trying to ask. Sometimes you want to look top down, you want to look bottom up. Sometimes you want to bring those two things together. And um, the problem with that metaphor of the selfish gene, or even the other metaphors that are being used, is that the problem that they're, they become morally freighted, right? They, beca they become value laden. And so we hear the word selfish gene, and we think, oh, it's somehow these genes are having some kind of, um, you know, they're behaving in some kind of amoral way. Or maybe we think, well, the only reason why we are the way we are is because of some kind of, some kind of mechanistic amoral property of genes. I think that's incorrect. So what I was using those two examples for was simply to say, actually, it's not clear to me, first of all, that the science can be interpreted in multiple different ways that can be helpful as an epistemological, or a fancy word for how do we uh, obtain truth about things that can be helpful. But I was also saying that, in fact, extracting some kind of, un, some kind of meaning from the science is, is not that straightforward. And I think, I would say that one of the big problems in the evolutionary science that is full of metaphors, survival of the fittest, natural, you know, all these kinds of things, which are helpful metaphors in a narrow way in the sense that they're describing how something works. Um, but they have all kinds of moral overtones that I think are misunderstood. That's bad for science, actually, because that, that sometimes puts metaphysical weight onto scientific things that shouldn't be there. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.